Welcome to Rautas Discography slash Why This and That Band is one of the best bands ever. This time I'm obviously talking about the band in question that is here. Morbid Angel. That is uh, a cornerstone death metal band as many of you know. If you don't know, then you are probably watching the very wrong video for you. But if you're curious enough, maybe you'll uh, get a little bit of help here, or at least uh, some sort of vision, or at least an opinion about why I think Morbid Angel is a band to totally check out and to be liked. Now, Morbid Angel was born in early 1980s, so they are more than 30 years in the history by now, started in 1983 to be exact. They at first, you know, had a little bit of uh, going on, stuff like let's try this and that and uh, have a different kind of ideas with the band names. But they ended up with Morbid Angel, which is by, uh, by any means, it's not a bad name, but on the contrary, it's one that is very fitting for the band's music, lyrics and all the uh, kind of a craziness there is in the band, um, or at least a, let's say, this kind of a unique snowflake thing. Not only their logo, but their music and the basically everything in the band kind of shows that this band is one of a kind thing. But since this is not about getting uh, all kinds of details and lineup changes and all that, because that would take a hours for me to go through and of course I don't know everything so let's just start talking about their albums. Now Morbid Angel was born uh, in a kind of an age when it was typical the bands actually do demo recordings and I'm not just talking about you know kind of rehearsal tapes which would just you know get copied to your friends but actually do demos and, uh, you know, try out different kind of things and then the demos would get, you know, uh, tape trading and other ways into the big world wide open and uh, they would, you know, get named by that, they would get gigs, they would get record deals and all that stuff. But maybe most importantly, uh, they would actually kind of, you know, do their job as like, hey, we actually sound like this. Maybe we could improve that and that. Maybe we could just try something like this and that. And, you know, get it going. Something that I think many bands have now totally forgotten because it's just so easy to, you know, um, home record everything and, you know, just skip through your first full-length album, do it self-financed and then let it go into the world. And then you're wondering why, why people are like, oh, man, you should not have done it because it's so raw. It's kind of like uh, unfinished in a way because it didn't go through all this demo phase. But I'm talking about this and that because that's a totally different idea. I'm just explaining why when Morbid Angel released their actually first uh, studio album, All This Madness, why they were so goddamn great uh, in the very beginning. So All This Madness, it wasn't their first or second release. Actually, they had uh, quite a few demos before that so when it was out they already knew very well what they were doing and um, because of this morbid angel kind of a discography is anywhere but linear linear it is uh, actually there's abominations of desolations and then there are like kind of live live albums which are kind of in a messed weird kind of a order it's really hard to uh, track with facts just by, you know, having those CDs, obviously, can, you can do a little bit of um, journalism and interviewing and stuff, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Uh, I'm just wanna, uh, trying to say here, it is, uh, it's not so easy than, you know, just pick up the albums, uh, you know, in the order they were released and, you know, just figure it out how things went out. Anyway, Elders of Madness, great death metal album and kind of the one that actually set the name in stone kind of, you know, turned the page for death metal. It was not about being as brutal as possible. It was not about 
um, you know, chopping someone's heads off. It's not about zombie plagues and all that. They are very kind of a devilish, uh, satanic, uh, diabolical, uh, anti-Christianity and all kind of that kind of topics uh, in the Elders of Madness. But it's not only just, you know, those topics that actually make it, you know, worthwhile uh, listening or, you know, worshipping the band. It's also that these guys were greatly talented as hell and they had great riffs, uh, kind of a weird ideas even, considering that Death Metal was just about to be born, basically, you know, the first phase of Death Metal. But when I went and uh, listened to the whole discography in the prior days before doing this video, I kind of got reminded uh, how trashy uh, Alters of Madness actually is. Pretty much like Eden Back to Life, Life by Cannibal Corpse, or you know, uh, like Beneath the, Beneath the Remains by Sepultura. Elders of Madness has quite a lot of trash influence, which and again is no surprise uh, given the year, but it's, it's kind of a, like an interesting to see that meanwhile these guys were basically pioneering um, huge steps of totally kind of new genre. And there were the rules, basically, like what kind of uh, vocal should you have, what kind of production, um, what kind of guitar, guitar tune you should have, and all that stuff. You know, they were basically laying out rules. They were, you know, laying out the whole path, which way that well was about to basically evolve. And so it's not a kind of a surprise that Oz of Man is, is so much, you know, appreciated it so much worshipped copied and all that stuff it is a great album where the band actually has a um, few of their um, kind of a uh, top songs uh, for example uh, immortal rights uh, from the you know very beginning maze of torment obviously uh, well lords of fever and plagues yeah but chapel of ghouls oh man you know it's like uh, just those riffs combined with those vocals and just everything and everything is just finished with a beautiful beautiful uh album cover you get the idea all those of madness are all kinds of these weird faces which are said to reflect every emotion and uh feeling and whatever human humans have so all those of madness great album and a uh, kind of a um, Kind of a milestone thing in a way uh, given the album is so goddamn early for being a dead metal album. Now um, it didn't take much time really for uh, Morbid Angel to do it to their step two. A couple of years later Blessed Are the Sick which is yet again another great album full of great songs, maybe a little curious production, but once again, album that I got, you know, totally hooked every time I listened to it. I kind of forgot between my listening, you know, times, between the spins that how great album it is, but it is, well, one of the best albums by the band, and uh, it's kind of difficult for me to decide uh, why Alders of Madness would be better than Blessed Are the Sick. Maybe Alders wins, but Blessed Are the Sick is, is a kind of improvement towards the death metal side and towards this kind of a, um, how to put it, more weird and more diabolical direction where the band was going. And you have to remember, this was 1991, way before basically Norwegian black metal and, you know, any Big black metal scenes, you know, started to bloom, and kind of the face when you know dead metal was just turning bigger. So once again, they were laying the stones for many bands to you know, you know, catch up and follow. And mostly, uh, the most bands never managed to do that. Now, um, I don't think Blessed Are the Sick has so many hit songs uh, in a sense, as such as Alders and Madness. But then again, there are songs like. Day of Suffering, which has just, you know, perfect riffing. 
and even though it has these kind of a, I cannot call them ambience, but you know, kind of synth parts, uh, it still still is you know overall a great album with a lot of a lot of good stuff and clearly a kind of a progressive one uh, uh, compared to the you know the actual debut one, Elders of Madness. But I think the game really changed and the trash part started, you know, kind of before Cotton when Covenant in 1993 came out. And this actually, I think, changed the rules because not only it featured uh, kind of a more progressed dead metal band, you know, slow paced songs, but also clean vocals. Think of kind of emptiness. It's just something that, you know, makes chills go down my spine. Clean vocals by Dave Vincent and all that stuff. It's just totally awesome. And once again, it's an album uh, which I kind of always, when I listen to it, kind of makes me feel why I don't listen to this goddamn album like every week or at least every month uh, because it definitely is a great album and I think it's actually one of the best uh, even better than Alders of Madness maybe it's so goddamn uh, well done album with great songs basically nothing uh, useless in it, the production is cool and the cover image, I must say, it's totally different from pre two previous ones because it's a, well, it's a different kind of image, uh, but but I think it's, in a way, it's kind of a undervalued maybe, I don't know, but totally a great album and if those two previous albums didn't nail it, then I think Covenant pretty much did it. Now, then something changed because 1995 is the year when Domination got out. For me, it's my favorite death metal album about Morbid Angel. One of the best death metal albums in all times, but for Morbid Angel uh, releases, it's, it's, it's my favorite. And I know many people don't like it that much. Actually, it's, I think it's one of the most uh, controversial album in terms of uh, Morbid Angel, because maybe for people it changed the band a little bit too much. But I think it's just, you know, uh, just awesome. I think uh, Dave Vincent even further, you know, kind of managed to take more out of his vocal cords. I think the production is awesome. I think they're great great songs and uh, I don't know for me it's kind of a the peak moment and uh, think of like Dawn of the Angry and um, songs like Hate Work, uh, Where the Slime Live obviously or even the first track, track Dominate there are these kind of a weird uh, well non-typical for dead metal bands kind of ideas such as uh, you know Caesar's Palace and all that stuff but or dreaming the track after that one but I think it is despite the little bit ugly cover uh, the Morbid Angel album and uh, maybe because if it's kind of a controversy I think it's that's one of the reasons why it is so meaningful not only for me but the whole genre it totally kind of made, you know, the band to just, you know, we don't care about your genre rules. We do what we want because we are morbid angel. Now, not these are not their words, but this is kind of a feeling that I've gotten, you know, out from this album. Nevertheless, some people don't like it. Some people maybe consider it mediocre or bad one. I think it's just near perfect album. The number one. But... Then came uh, Entangled in, in, in Chaos, which is a live album and which I don't kind of consider be part of these um, alphabetical order albums, you know, A for Aldous of Madness, B for Blessed Are the Sick, C for Covenant, D for Domination. And then again, there's another exception to this rule, you know, Abominations of Desolation, which kind of don't 
fit into this alphabetical order. Anyway, Entitled is Chaos, I had to skip over it because it's a live album and in, in that sense it's not meaningful in, uh, in the ways of you know adding new music to Morbid Angel. Now, Formulas to the Fatal Formula's Fatal Little Flesh came out in 1998, and that's one of the uh, tough cookies for me to crack. It's not only because now the main man, the vocalist, bass player, Dave Vincent, had been gone and Steve Tucker took over, but I think it's, it kind of, you know, the tempo went high. Uh, it's, it sounded kind of like a different band, and it's very aggressive versus the previous albums, so it's kind of felt like uh, the band had turned to a new chapter. But the main problem, in my opinion, is that it kind of lacks uh, these hit songs. But I already covered this in my classic album reviews just um, uh, like a week ago. So if you want more of my opinion about Formula's Fate of the Flesh, please go and check it out. Uh, but I think that Formula Fatal to the Flesh is not a good album in, as, when it comes to Morbid Angel. It's totally a good album if you just consider it a death metal album. But for many minor flaws, I think that was uh, kind of a setback. And I think it's by easily uh, one of the less good Morbid Angel albums. That's not like one of my least favorite ones. It's not the worst, maybe, but it's ne definitely not the best either. But then again, I know there are fans who just, you know, like it uh, above other albums. So, once again, uh, nice move from the back. Now, it took a couple of years more when uh, Gateways to Annihilation came out, and once again, that changed the game. That is, by the way, the my home gym uh, cloth poster or flag or whatever it's called uh, the background which kind of reminds me how great album it is and uh, I, haven't, I haven't been listening to that album uh, for many years until now a couple of days ago prior to make this video and it's weird that some you know the first riffs kind of you know ring in my head every now and then even though i haven't been listening to that album for many years and i think that is one way to tell me how big an impact it actually made when i got to hurt this album and uh, i wasn't surprised how much i liked this album because some sometimes it goes to a different direction in other ways um, sometimes it you know, I have the memory of the album being really good, a real masterpiece. And when I listen to it after a few years, and I'm just like, oh man, this wasn't so great. I'm disappointed. Maybe I just, you know, sell it. Now, Gateways to Annihilation, in my opinion, is definitely one of the best Morbid Angel albums. It kind of showed after Formal's Fatal of Flesh. After that one, it kind of showed that uh, you know, Morbid Angel is back into their game, you know, having more slow pace, more uh, kind of a sinister feeling with their songs, but more importantly, better riffs, better songs all in all, uh, better overall feeling, in my opinion. And uh, I think that's why I think uh, Gateways is not that greatly rated as it should be. I think that's one of their most underrated albums. At least I don't often see people like, oh man, Gateways to Annihilation, it's so good. But I think it is. And uh, if, for example, you would be a new to the band, that would be one of the albums I would actually suggest to check out first before going to the more difficult albums. Which would be, in this case, Heretic, that came like three years after. Now, third album by Steve Tucker. Um, this album, I remember at first I kind of liked it, but now that I just, you know, listened to it, I was pretty disappointed. Uh, to me, it kind of sounds like more um, improvised version or relative kind of a brother to uh, Formula's Fatal to the Flesh. The songs, while, while they are mostly just, you know, like really nice to listen to, 
they kind of don't have these hooks that kind of you know drag into their dark cave but it's more like yeah these are nice but where are the goddamn hit songs like Dawn of the Anger, Day of Suffering, or Chapel of Ghouls, or God of Emptiness, or any of those great songs uh, for which uh, Morbid Angel is so often uh, remembered of for. Uh, but Heretic is just full of these kind of like, uh, yeah, this is pretty okay, but what next? And then towards the end it kind of becomes this kind of a demo compilation in a way. It's just full of meaningless tracks, which kind of, you know, is a kind of like a letdown feeling. Like, so this is how you reward a listener. Surely there are great stuff in terms of, you know, playing, like technical sides and all that stuff. But beat production, beat songs, I think Heretic is actually uh, one of the weakest albums. Now, it might be the weakest, but then there is this weird weird case that came after that and this one took like eight years and they were lined up lineup changes because Dave Winston was back in the game again and all that stuff now I'm talking about this elephant in the room called Illud Divinum Insanus which is also the I album now uh, this album is a really weird move for Morbid Angel I actually remember when I got it for review and I gave it gave it a 8 out of 10 and some people were just you know kind of mad at me for giving it such a good score and some people are like what the hell is this guy doing what what does he know about death metal how can you know he rate this album so good because it, he has these horrible horrible kind of uh, industrial metal tracks and this is, I think, where Dave Vincent's industrial background kind of uh, came true, you know, to Morbid Angel, which was a bad idea. Uh, but the thing is, which, is that if you just, you know, remove these kind of weak tracks, uh, these industrial tracks, there are great, great Morbid Angel uh, compositions on the album, like like Blades for Baal, for example, and uh, Exist of Ulgore, and uh, some others which are just, you know, great. If only these bad industrial tracks, which, by the way, are like three of them, uh, would be removed, I think that would be uh, easily on the better half of the band. I'm not saying that would be like in my top three or anything, because it's so tough competitions. Like I said, Covenant, uh, gateways to Annihilation, Dominate, I don't think any any album could, like, maybe ever pass that barrier, but nevertheless, it would be easily so much better than, like, Heretic or Formulas Fatal to Flesh, maybe even, like, Blessed or the Sick, I don't know, uh, because these tracks are quite horrible. Uh, so if there is any reason to skip one of the Morbid Angel albums, that would be the I album. But, like I said, there are those great hits, and it's kind of a sad that it was ruined with these uh, industrial tracks. So, interesting album in many ways, but kind of a disaster in some ways. But I still stand behind my review score. I still think it's 4 out of 5 stars album, and definitely something people should, you know, check out. Maybe in the digital format rather than CD, because at least that way you can just pretty much delete the unwanted tracks and go for the mini CD compilation style if you want to. Anyway, weird album, but has definitely great tracks. And uh, now the reason why I'm making this disco record is basically because Kingdoms disdained uh, the latest uh, album after six years of the previous album, Illude album, came out. There is also this album called J, which means Juvenilia. And I was like, what the hell, I got totally missed it. But it's a, also a live album, much like Entangling Chaos. So it's not those real alphabetical order uh, studio albums. So let's skip over that one. Now, Kingdoms Disdain just came out 3rd of December 2017. So it's 
uh, only a few uh, days old basically so I am kind of like giving it the benefit of doubt uh, when I'm you know trying to figure how good album it is uh, but having listened to it a couple of times now maybe three times or so uh, I must say that it is a strong album it's kind of a strong comeback uh, after this disappointing illude and this kind of a disappointing heretic as well and uh, even though I don't see it going to as high in my ratings as gateways I still think that uh, Kingdom's Disdain even with its kind of a mostly just you know new lineup I think it's it's gonna be one of the better albums Morbid Angel have ever done Certainly, uh, it has its weirdness in production. It's kind of a fast and aggressive in terms of, you know, like formulas fatal to flesh. But in my opinion, it kind of feels more energetic and more uh, kind of a dynamic album than the F1. So now I, of course, don't know how it will, you know, find its place about this discography in the following years who knows how it will change in my mind and because it's all, always about how you feel how you get to know an album after you give a decent in, in a amount of spins and uh, sort of that but now my thinking is that kingdom's disdain is something that morbid angel kind of gravely needed it's something that they were like basically aching for after giving this disappointment uh, called the eye album so now i think the the guys in the band being 50 plus i think now they have uh, kind of finally come back and the thing which i forgot to mention there's a couple of things which i can basically conclude this video with is it's my uh, encounters with Morbid Angel. Now I never got to actually interview the band, interview the band, actually. But there was a funny moment when when they were playing in, you know, after Heretic in in Finland in the Numirok Open Air uh, Festival in midsummer. Me and my friends were actually, you know, watching the gig with and there's a press, you know, this kind of a press pass. The thing is, we had this kind of small press, you know, kind of a audience area. And, you know, we enjoyed the gig and blah, blah, blah. We went backstage basically after the gig and Steve Tucker was, you know, kind of a, doing kind of this press event type of thing, you know, not one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews, but, you know, just, you know, in general, you know, answering questions. And me and my colleague were like, nah that's kind of a boring way we don't want to actually do that just you know let, let's just doing something else and then we suddenly uh, encountered trey as on the backstage area just you know like wandering around or something like that and i don't actually remember whether we got beers somewhere but the thing was my friend actually wanted to just you know basically ask for you know autograph and we actually talked for an hour with Trey and he was a really nice guy he was just you know talking about the band and you know playing gigs and all that stuff for a long time and we didn't even have any kind of you know pen and paper or recording device to you know do this kind of interview even though it would have been you know just like basically a perfect situation to do that so it's kind of like you know one of those things when you just you know bump to an artist and you just chat with them like they were like friends of yours instead of having this kind of a official interview moment so that's kind of like a warm memory of my first morbid angel live thing now a few years later uh when dave vincent was back in the band already uh, i saw them again for the second time in tuska festival in helsinki uh, i don't actually remember which year this was but it was, I think, before Illud, maybe 2008, 2009, something along those lines anyway. And um, even though Tuska is, you know, 
held in July and um, it's supposed to be kind of a warm or maybe the end of June anyway. Uh, but basically, you know, should be warm summertime in Finland too. But that was just kind of a gray clouds all over and it was like a little bit of good chance of whether it's just gonna rain or not. Now Morbid Angel uh, got on stage. It wasn't still, you know, late at night and in Finland, if you don't know, uh, we don't get, you know, dark very early in the summertime. It's quite the contrary and we barely get dark. So it wasn't like it's, it's dark outside. It's, you know, just basically gray. But then Morbid Angel, you know, start to play and it, it's kind of getting kind of gloomy weather and it's, it's kind of like a not warm and sun, sun shining and all that stuff. And these words basically, you know, sunk in my head so very well that I still remember, even though I have lots of, uh, you know, hard time remembering even important stuff sometimes. But these words I almost remember from word to word. I, maybe they went exactly like that. I'm not sure. But it started to, you know, drop a little bit of rain. Not totally like pouring, but kind of raining anyway. And then Dave Winston said, and I cannot, you know, even try to emulate his voice, but he said something like, It seems that when we are stage, even the heaven is weeping. And boom, suddenly, I was just, you know, having chills, and I'm like, shit, this is the moment, like, Morbid Angel on stage with the original vocalist, and it's all like, oh man, kind of like the perfect you know, way to actually enjoy your uh, outdoors festival. So sometimes things things just click magically and it's all perfect. And maybe uh, five years later, when they were again in Tuska playing, they just, you know, did a wonderful job. This time the sun was shining and uh, they were playing in like uh, late afternoon, early evening. I don't remember the exact time, but they just, you know, basically got full load of great songs and it didn't matter if it's what, like 25 degrees Celsius outside, Morbid Angel just, you know, totally killed with their show. So for me, they have proven to be great live band, great studio band with many good albums. And personally, I have all those uh, CDs in my shelf when it comes to studio albums, except these uh, last ones. And the reason is, they're just so goddamn great. There are only two dead metal bands which I think are better overall than Morbid Angel. The thing is, can you guess which one? Now, this is all from me. Uh, way too long a chat about why Morbid Angel is one of the best dead metal bands ever and why they will be that in the future as well. Once Morbid, always morbid thank you for watching and should you have any cool comments experiences about morbid angel some special feelings or just you don't want to disagree with me about the band let me know in the comment field below thank you i'm jerry and thank you for watching this is rauda see you soon again with another video about this and that